It's way we need the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> One of the big thing that will be a, a real big concern uh, when you <clears throat> won't have the modern convenience is understanding um, how to get rid of your waste. Now I grew up, and I think you mentioned it uh, with uh, outhouse. That maybe need to be understood or mentioned, help people to understand just how that works. In our next section with health and hygiene, we're going to cover that because it is important. We have biblical um, instruction given in regards to that. Um, but make sure and have containers for water, and we're going to get more detail of that. Let's take a 10-minute break, and we'll come back, and then we'll get into the health and hygiene. Do I have any nurses, nurses' assistants? Yeah, but you know how to do bed baths. Who, who's given bed baths before? Okay, lots of you. Good. Okay, so you understand the concept of bathing with just a little bit of water. Okay, now when I give a bed bath, just saying that I have soap, Am I going to put my soap and lather up in my water there? Why? What's that? I won't have any rinse water, okay? So if you think about the concept of giving bed baths, when I, when I first moved to Kentucky, we didn't have running water, we didn't have... Um, indoor plumbing, we had nothing. The way that we got our water was if it rained, we had, uh, we had purchased several 55 gallon barrels, plastic barrels that had the lids that clamped on. And we, would, we had built a barn and it was myself and two friends of mine that had purchased this property together. And if we were running low on water and it rained at 2 a.m., we got up at 2 a.m and set up our collection, our, our water catchment system. We had it set up <clears throat> so that we collected off of the front of the barn roof, which is a, it was quite a large barn that we built. We collected off of the front of the roof that was out uh, from the edge of the woods. We would let it rain for a little bit, and then we would plug in our system for the water to run into our barrels. In the wintertime, that was kind of tough because in Kentucky it gets fairly cold in the winter. So we had several of these barrels in the middle of the barn and we would carry the water by buckets into the barn to refill all of our barrels. That's where we got our water for bathing, for washing dishes, things like that. What we would do, we would, we would try to filter it. Of course we let the rain clean off the barn roof for a while before we started collecting the water. And then we would, as we poured it into the barrels in the inside of the barn, we had a huge, like, T-shirt that we would tie around the top, and we would pour the water through that. That would catch leaves or bugs or anything like that. And then whenever we would get ready to use that and carry that into the house, we put it into big kettles and we would boil it before we used it. And whenever we, we put it, you'll see when we go out to the tent, there's a... Um, this thing is really tough on the consonants. Um, we had a um, blue water container with a spigot on it, and we would put just a few drops of bleach in that just to make sure that you know we weren't you know going to wash our dishes with some bacteria or something. And that system actually worked quite well, but it was a lot of work. It was very labor intensive, but that's all we could do at the time because the county wouldn't run water down our little section of road. We couldn't afford a well, and so it was really, there was no year-round spring. We had a spring, but it, would, it was seasonal. And so I, that was the beginning of my real wake-up call to the importance of having water on a property. And so collecting rainwater does work, but just know it's going to be labor intensive, okay, it's, it's going to cost effort. So <clears throat> what we would do, uh, this is what we have now. At the time when I, when I lived in Kentucky, before I married Kaylin, I had, does everybody know what a wash tub is? It's one of those big, 
wash tubs. Yeah, for washing clothes. There you go. And we have that out there that we'll show you when we get outside. But I had a, I had a, I think mine was a number two wash tub, which means it was, you know, about yay big and about this deep. And I could take a very good bath in a gallon of water. How many of you think you could take a good bath with a gallon of water? Several of you. Good. Okay, good. So I have some people with experience here. Now, washing my hair was a different story. When it was hair washing day, my hair was shorter then. It took another gallon to wash my hair because my hair is so thick. To rinse all the soap out took a little bit of, of effort. So what I would do, well, just pretend this is my washcloth. I had my water in a gallon jug, and I had my basin, and I would wet my cloth, and I would put some soap on it. And don't put that soap in the rinse water, okay, or in your, your bucket of water. And of course, this is stainless steel, so I can actually heat this right on our little cook stove. We have a cook stove here that we're going to show you, and then we have another one out in the tent that we're going to show you. So I could just have this sitting on the, the, the stove while the stove's running, and I've always got warm water. Okay? And, and when we lived in Kentucky, Kaylin and I, we had a regular size um, wood cook stove, and you had to really watch it, keep it all the way over away from the wood box because it would boil, and it would be boiling all my water out. So soap up my cloth. I always wash from clean to dirty, so I do my face first, and then I'm going to do my upper body and then my legs. And then my aunt, one time my uncle was, had been in a car wreck, and she was giving him bed baths in the hospital. And she said to my uncle, I'm going to wash as far up as possible and as far down as possible, but you're washing possible. <laughs> so when you wash possible, that's the last thing, okay? That's the last thing you wash. And... Um, if you want to feel even more clean and you have a little bit of water left, you can actually kind of sit over that tub and pour the last of the water over possible if you would like to, to make sure you, because that kind of burns if you get soap in some places. So at any rate, that's the big thing there is just make sure that this basin, that's the way I did it. I would just use it as a catch basin. I poured my water. You could have a little... Uh, I don't know where, <clears throat> you could have a little pot, something like this, and I'm going to talk about all this stuff over here in a little bit. You could have a little dipper to, to wa rinse out your washcloth and then bathe the body part, and then you could rinse it a little bit, or even better yet, have a separate cloth for rinsing. So you have one cloth with soap and one cloth for rinsing, okay? Now these are paper towels, so we're just pretending, but you can see that having things that are durable is going to be very important because you're not going to be able to replace it. So whenever you're thinking about this time frame and you're going to go stock up on washcloths or whatever, don't do what I've done in the past. I'll just go to the dollar store and buy a dollar pack of washcloths. You know. If you're going to buy several, yeah, but those things are going to be able to read the newspaper through those things in a couple of months. So buy quality, okay? So that's <clears throat> on bathing, basically all I wanted to cover. But one of the big things is, is these supplies. You know, this is kind of a luxury item for, in my mind, a stainless steel bucket like this. These are not cheap. I think we paid like thirty dollars for that. What does that say? Twenty nine ninety five. Twenty nine ninety five. And this one, what is that? Forty dollars and seventy five. Forty dollars and seventy five cents. Now you can get cheaper. There are cheaper op options. You can find five gallon metal buckets. Metal buckets are very handy to have because you can use it to put your wood ashes in, and wood ashes are valuable anyway. You can make soap and use them in the garden and many other things. So these are just some options. When we lived in Kentucky, there was we lived in an Amish and Mennonite community. And if you can ever visit an Amish and Mennonite community, not a store that's stuck off by itself in a big city, 
but an actual Amish Mennonite community, you'll be able to find a lot of really durable goods like this for a lot better price. If you bought this online, you'd probably pay a good bit more for it. And this is a nice heavy one. If you've not looked at it, you can pass it around. It's, it's not one of those really thin ones that you push the bottom and it's going to ping and turn inside out or whatever. So these are, these are very good quality buckets. And you can use a pot, you know, like a canning kettle or something like that. But those um, porcelain on steel canning kettles, if you, if you bump it and chip, it's going to rust, okay? So I try to keep that for its intended purpose as much as possible and use other stuff like this for heating. Now, if, if we are... My husband mentioned that even during No Buy, No Sale, we're going to be doing some evangelism. We're going to be probably hoofing it on foot to go to the cities and warn and teach. And so this is a collapsible bucket that goes in my husband's uh, backpack because you still need water even if you're camping. But you're not going to take this with you while you're backpacking or camping. In, you know. But you can still have a water container. You can also just use your um, stainless steel water bottle, but that's not a lot of water. If you want to, if it, there's a creek close by and you can go get some water and bring it back to your camp, that's going to be a lot, a lot easier. Okay. I just wanted to say, if you do get an opportunity, as my wife mentioned, we did live in the Amish and Mennonite community. Go visit there. Spend some time there because those people live the no buy, no sell lifestyle. You can find a lot of supplies that would be or, uh, good quality for you because they don't buy cheap stuff because no, no. they're used to working with their hands. That's how they do most of their work. So you can find a lot of good tools there, a lot of good, um, like my wife mentioned, these are heavy duty stainless steel. This is quality. It's not a cheap one that's going to bend very easily. It's going to last some time, but um, consider that if you have opportunity and know of an Amish and Mennonite community, go there. I think next is dental. I'm just going to go ahead and talk about the dental. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, next on the list here of things that we wanted to, to talk about and at least touch on is dental issues, oral care. Everybody's had a toothache, right? At some point. No matter what kind of pain you're having, whenever you're having that kind of pain is always the worst kind of pain possible. If you've got a headache, that's the worst pain. If you've got a backache, that's the worst pain. If you've got a toothache, that really is bad pain because you can't eat, you can't chew properly. And think about what it's going to be like during no buy, no sell if you get a bad cavity. So I cannot stress enough, and we are literally putting our money where our mouth is on this one because we are currently visiting a biological dentist in Dothan. And I can tell you, he found things with my teeth I had no idea were going on. They did, um, what's he call it, a cone, cone beam x-ray where the yeah. thing goes around your head. And he found, I had a, a tooth on this side that every once in a while just was a little twingy. Well here, the whole inside of the tooth had gone soft. If you've not heard a little bit of my health journey, <clears throat> I got Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. I got tetanus before that. Then I got Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. That triggered autoimmunity. And so I've got all these crazy health issues. The autoimmunity triggered hand problems. And so I had five hand surgeries. So it's kind of been a, a journey for me. And so I'm dealing, the biggest thing I'm dealing with right now still is the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever and the autoimmune disease. That has affected my teeth. The, the dentist, when we went down there, he looked at the microbiome of my mouth and told me, you have autoimmune disease. I said, yes, I do. He could tell based on the microbiome in my mouth. So if you've never considered going to a biological dentist, not just a run-of-the-mill dentist, and having things checked, you really might want to consider that because what he found in my mouth, if we hadn't caught it early, would have hit me during this time that we're talking about. 
and my teeth would have, it would have been a major issue. I may not have been able to eat. So we're putting a considerable sum in my mouth, but I'm telling you something, our priorities financially even need to shift. Because if you can't eat, if you don't have adequate shelter, whether it's clothing or whatever, you're going to be in trouble. Okay, so I just want to encourage you, if you, if you can, go to one of these biological dentists and see what's really going on in your mouth. Okay. Why don't we just continue with <coughs> hygiene? Okay. Uh, first aid. We have a video on our YouTube channel about this first aid kit and then my husband this is the one he keeps in his in his truck this one has some things in it that you know you can only fit so much in a first aid kit but I'm not going to break this down entirely but I am going to show you a couple of features on this kit and why we like this this is the military molly m-o-l-l-e and somebody else is going to have to tell you what that means it's multiple load bearing something something I don't know what it stands for but anyway you can actually strap this like on my husband's military backpack here this is designed to strap on the outside so this is for things that you're gonna need immediate or urgent access to this pack uh, we used to make these but the overhead was quite high so we stopped doing it and it took a lot of time and so, but these packs you can get off of eBay. And the way it works is it's got this strap that comes around it to secure it. And then it has a strap over the top to secure it to the back. This part right here is kind of a base. And that is going to stay, let's, let's say somebody is injured and I need my kit, but I don't have time to unstrap it from my backpack. I can just rip it off my backpack and go. I've got my kit, okay? And so um, I'll just open it up and show you a few things that are in it. I have some bandage materials. I have one of those SAM splints. Again, we have a video specifically on this kit on our YouTube channel. I got these uh, bags off of eBay. Make sure that it has that feature where it has the Velcro that you can just rip free. I really like that feature. Um, another thing that you could use for, the, the, for a first aid kit is one of those trifold um, or roll up, what do you call it? A bathroom kit, you know, like a shower kit that unrolls and has all your little toiletries and all that. Those make pretty good little first aid kits too. So you need to have some type of first aid stuff and know that it's going to perish with the using. So you need to have stuff to refill this. You need to have know that, you know, I've got cloths that I can use. Sanitary pads make great pressure bandages. So if you have somebody that has a, a bad cut or wound and it's bleeding profusely, you have your wife, your daughter, whatever, yourself, if you have sanitary napkins, that's what they're designed to do is absorb blood, right? You can use that as a pressure bandage. Okay, so those are cheap and they're easy to, to get right now. So even if you're a man, I actually taught this to my first aid. I've, I've certified all my students in first aid when I taught here. And Brother Don Miller calls me on the phone one day. He was standing in that section in Walmart and he said, you know, I'm kind of lost. I, stand, I, I feel like an idiot standing here. I don't know what to get. So I had to give him some ideas of what to get. <clears throat> but that is a good thing to do for uh, pressure bandages. Now, my husband's vehicle first aid kit, the biggest difference here is that we have chest seals. If you don't know what a chest seal is, you need to take a first aid class. I recommend a wilderness first aid class. The one that I took where I got my WFA um, certification from, was an, it's an online class at uh, Herbal Medics Academy. Herbal Medics Academy. Sam Kaufman is the instructor. He used to be a Green Beret medic, and the guy knows his stuff. So wilderness first aid, 
Herbal Medics Academy, and Sam Kaufman is his name. Chest seals, if you don't know, if you have a gunshot wound, you're going to need two because you're going to have an entry wound and an exit wound. So two chest seals for that. You can have a sucking chest wound with that. Anyway, I'm not going into first aid stuff. I'm just encouraging you to have some first aid supplies on hand and have them put together. I have one of these in my van. My husband has one in his truck. And these ones are for backpacking and camping. <coughs> okay, what's next? Medical missionary supplies and knowledge. We have at home, and Sister Marilyn, I don't see her. She must not be here anymore. But anyway, she makes fomentation pads and kits and stuff. I have a tote, a medical missionary tote that has fomentation pads, the pot, has everything. I can grab that literally and go to somebody's house and I have everything that I need to give treatments. <coughs> You're going to have to talk for a little bit. I can chime in on that a little bit. Okay. Medical missionary supplies. My wife covered it. Just to make sure because I don't know if we need to explain to many of you because that's why you're here. But have the, <coughs> have the necessary supplies that would allow you to do... <coughs> excuse me. It must be the stand. <coughs> <coughs> that would allow you to do even the simple treatments as hot foot baths or fomentations. Um, water is a very powerful thing, and I know that the, I don't know who put it on, but how many were part of the class that they did here when they made their own charcoal? Was there anybody here that, anyway, I, okay, there's some folks there, wonderful. And so even learning that skill, so you don't have to have charcoal with you, you can learn how to make it. And even with um, knowing, I don't know if we're going to get to that. I think that's part of this. But knowing medicinal wild uh, plants can be very valuable because we're not going to have medicines with us. And many of the medications that you see today were derived from the things of nature. But they're only synthetically made. Of course, they have all the side effects, which the plants don't. So start learning now what plants could... Uh, serve certain purposes. For example, something as simple as a bug bite. Does anybody know what you would do for a bug bite? A bee sting. You could put charcoal on it. I'm talking about a plant now. Aloe vera would, would soothe it. But plantain, does anybody know what plantain is? Yes, plantain. You mush that plantain up and rub it on there. Take the sting right away. Yes, please, give Brother Marvin a microphone. Is, you want to wait? The microphone's not turned on yet. Before we came here, we was at Heartland, and uh, I was a ground supervisor there. So anyway, we was back there. Uh, I was taking the students, and we would gather wood, because that's what they used for the heating. I had a gasoline container. Now I was pouring gasoline on the wood to, you know, and then stand back and then take the light. Well, there was burning some. You want to hold the microphone closer? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. There was burning some wood, and I saw a streak of fire running. And it was running towards me. And I had a gasoline uh, container in my hand, and I'm looking. I'm thinking, man, this thing coming for this gasoline tank. Before I just about got it out of my hand, it exploded. Blew me out the fire, but it messed up my hand. So I went, yeah, my face and everything. So my wife was really into the health, and the, we had a nurse there. And uh, so they just, uh, what we decided to do, they put plantain posters, poster, uh, of poultices, white potato. Yeah, white potato. And then, white potato. Yep. Then they put the plantain. You can still see some of the scar. It burnt that whole top of my hand off. So you can see the, the wriggling of the bone. The wriggling of the bone. It hit the side of my face and everything. I was a mess. But uh, we, I didn't take no um, Tylenol and nothing like that. They kept working on it. And finally, they peeled that thing off. And that skin starting to grow back. 
it was something that I, cause this was the first time we ever done this nature stuff. And uh, it was amazing to see how that plant, and we used to go out and pick it up out the ground. So that is a definitely a miracle working plant. Amen. And God's, his whole nature is full of these things. Now that's a whole nother class. But as my wife mentioned earlier, knowledge weighs how much? Nothing. Nothing. You can take it with you wherever you go. And understanding the principles and the healing power of the things in nature can serve us quite well. Um, because in this time period, we're not going to be able to buy or sell medications. Not going to happen. And so we need to have knowledge of what we can use in nature to provide for the things that we need. And so take the time to, to learn and study the things of nature. Um, did you want to continue? Yeah. <clears throat> I was also going to mention um, not, only, not only won't we be able to buy those things, we won't be able to have insurance. A lot right. of people rely on their medical insurance. Mm. You know, That's when right. something happens, they go right to the emergency room or the hospital, and that they're not, we're not going to be able to do that. We won't be able to buy insurance. So there's more time, reason to have that knowledge. Absolutely. During then, that time, let's say, let's say, for instance, one of your children was bitten by a brown recluse or a copperhead. Do you know what, do you know what happens or a rattlesnake. Do you know what happens to the tissues in the body when you get bitten by these venomous insects and reptiles? There's an enzyme that is in their venom that actually is, it, it kind of dissolves the glue that holds our cells together. If you've never seen pictures, and I, I have some that I could show you, but I'm not going to look it up. Go home and Google photograph of brown recluse spider bite or rattlesnake bite. You lose a lot of tissue. Most of the time you end up with a big huge crater <clears throat> of tissue that dies. There is an enzyme in snake venom and in these spider venoms called hyaluronidase. There are, that is, that is what um, the, it's hyaluronic acid that's kind of like the glue that holds our cells together. And hyaluronidase is in these venoms and it dissolves that glue so that your cells just basically disintegrate and you have all this tissue injury. There are herbs such as echinacea, such as turmeric, that are hyaluronidase inhibitors. If you use plantain, echinacea, turmeric, use these on the wound and internally, you will not have the, the tissue damage that you will have if these are untreated. I guarantee you, most medical doctors do not know that. And so even if you have insurance now, I would still rather trust these herbs that God has given us than, that, than the medical doctors. Because between charcoal and, and these herbs, I believe that God has given us what we need to handle some very serious things. Now, don't get me wrong, allopathic, <coughs> excuse me, allopathic medicine chokes me up just to say allopathic. <laughs> but it has its place. I worked many years as an RN, and I worked in everything from critical care to home health to babies, and I, I did a lot of stuff when I was in nursing. And the door did not hit me in the backside when I left. And I don't need to go back. We have what we need, okay, for the most part. Now, if I'm in a car wreck and my bone is sticking out, I don't really need a charcoal poultice, okay? I might need some pins or something. It has its place. But it's way far farther out there than what most of us give. <clears throat> I want to talk about bug bites just a minute because I've had Rocky Mountain spotted, I have Rocky Mountain spotted fever. Now, if you ever have watched any of these survival shows on our YouTube videos on survival, nine times out of ten, the first thing these guys talk about when they come out of an experience like that is bugs. Bugs were the hardest thing they had to deal with. Now, 
we have all kinds of natural insect repellents. We have some pretty hefty ones. This is one by Sawyer that we do use. This is not to be used on your skin. You spray this on your outer clothing and leave it. You don't wash it out. In other words, you're going to wear that stuff for a while. So I would put it on like an outer shirt. You spray it on out, you know, just soak it down good. And then you wear that as your outer garment. That will work, but that's going to perish with the using. <clears throat> so what are some things that we could do, for instance, to keep ticks off? Okay. Can you think of anything? Citronella. Citronella. Are you going to be able to grow a citronella plant? I can't hear you. I'm hard of hearing. It dies off during the winter, but it comes back up. Okay. So. Now, if I'm on my homestead <laughs> and I know that I've planted that, which we should be planting our own herbs and stuff, that's good. If I'm in the wilderness, let's hope I can find it. Okay. My point with this is, yes, we need to be able to learn to identify these things. We need to have these things growing. But there are some very simple, practical things that we can do to help prevent tick bites. First thing is tuck everything in. That's one of the reasons why I wear knee socks. Because I can tuck my leggings in. Even in the summertime, you'll see me a lot of times, I've got something on my legs. <clears throat> Whether it's just a, a light pair of um, Scrub pants, those make, they're cotton usually. You can get them in all kind of different colors. And if your skirt's long enough, you can hide the things. Nobody knows you got them on. Tuck them in your socks. Because what do ticks do when they get on? They climb up. They're going up. And so they're trying to find an opening. So if you tuck your pant legs in, you tuck your shirt in, you keep your, you know, some sleeves close tight. These are things that you can do that will help. Light colored clothing, something like this color, you know, a khaki type color. It's very much easier to see ticks on lighter colored clothing than it is darker colored clothing. And just, I think it's sinister, but ticks are attracted to darker colors, okay? So lighter colors, you can see them better, and they don't seem to be as attracted to, um, to the lighter colored things. So, and that's something that is kind of important to me, having, having had Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. That is not something you want to go through, okay? I wouldn't wish that on anybody. Okay, wound care, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. We have a video about it on our YouTube channel. But one of the big things to make sure that you can do with a wound is clean it. So irrigation. One of the things that you can do if you're out and you happen to have a plastic water bottle is to just take your knife that you're always going to start carrying now, right? Everybody's going to start carrying a knife. We haven't talked about knives yet. But I always have one with me, okay? I have Mine is actually a clip knife. It's an automatic. I'm not supposed to have this, but anyway. Um, my husband bought this for me because at the time I was having a lot of problems with my hands. But you can take this and poke a hole in the lid and you can use this to irrigate a wound. Okay? So that's a, a really simple way. In the first aid kits, we have some, uh, we have a syringe in there. <clears throat> and so you're going to need a way maybe to get some clean water. But usually most people have one of these fairly handy. That's really all I'm going to talk about with wound care because um, the next session is on medicinal wild plants. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. That is a whole separate class. Maybe sometime we can do a weed walk or whatever here. When I lived here before, I was not really into wild plants and, and finding stuff. I spent a lot of time in the woods, but I was just stepping on everything. You know, I wasn't looking for plants. 
I know more what's in North Dakota, Kentucky, and those regions, so I'm still learning what's available to us around here, and I have found some pretty cool stuff here, but I'm still learning. Okay, here's the part that uh, I'm going to have my husband share this passage. Brother Marvin uh, mentioned it earlier, and it's about waste, human waste. I'm going to let my husband share a little bit, and then I'm going to share some things on this point as well. The microphone's back there. I just wanted to say something on the bug bites, too. Now, I did pest control for eight years, and you don't want to use that stuff. Um, but there are plants that, per, that contain some of the things, again, just like in, in the chemical world, they all were derived from something. But this permethrin, what's in here, was derived from marigolds. And what I found, because I've always wanted to, <clears throat> because I did the pest control in the wrong direction using chemicals, when my wife first met me, she said, I want to take your liver out and put it on a washboard and wash you, because I was surrounded in chemicals. I didn't understand that. Um, but I've always wanted to endeavor to find um, the things in nature that would help repel the pests that we have to deal with, because as my wife mentioned, I used to watch these survival shows, and it was one thing that they all had in common after they spent out a number of days out in the wilderness with just a knife and water or whatever they chose to do. When they'd come back and they would interview them, what was the hardest thing? Almost nine times out of ten, every one of them said that the insects, they were miserable. Um, and I can testify to that, but I use one of these too. It probably would be nice. You could put one of these over your head um, for those flying gnats. But there are many other options. But anyway, what I just wanted to share with you, to make it simple, what they're finding is to find a plant that is very fragrant because it will mask your scent. That's just boiling it down as simple as I can. I don't know of every plant, but there's peppermint, um, lavender, um, just trying to think of the different plants, but you can find them. Anyone that contains a, a fragrance, you can use that to rub on you. It will mask your scent. Um, that's as far as I've gotten with that. But anyway, I wanted to share a scripture verse with you. And because really, we, there's much we can learn from the, the experience of the children of Israel in the wilderness. There are many things that they had to learn because there was approximately two million people living in tents. There had to be some some structure, some guideline for them, especially when you think about it, about two million people when you're dealing with waste. Um, there had to be some counsel on that. But in Deuteronomy, chapter 23, there was counsel given in that area. In verses 12 and 13, It says, Thou shalt have a place also without the camp, whither thou shalt go forth abroad. So there is a designated area that you should go to do this. Verse 13 says, And thou shalt have a paddle upon thy weapon, and it shall be when thou wilt ease thyself abroad, thou shalt dig therewith, and shalt turn back and cover that which cometh from thee. So there's our instruction. It says, Have a paddle. And <clears throat> part of our our hands-on work we're going to let you do when we get outside is to make one of these paddles. This is a digging stick, and we'll explain more to you that um, how to make this and what the uses are for, but this is something similar that they use. They would dig a hole with this and then bury it, but don't bury it with this because you're going to use this for other things. Um, yeah, this will be your dirty end, this will be your clean end, and you see a notch on the end of this, because you can notch a pot on this, you can hold it over the fire. It has serves different purposes, so you want to be careful how you use this, but we're going to go outside, we're going to let you make one of these if you want. It's called a digging stick. So that's the counsel we're given on what to do with our waste. Um, I think that's everything for health and hygiene. We want to address... I want to cover a couple more things that I thought of. On the health, um, we, we like to walk in the woods, and my husband has this stick, and this stick has actually killed two copperheads at least. Yeah, so when you go to the woods, it's always good to have tools. And I found this stick because when I come from North Dakota, 
We don't have much for snakes. So when I came to Kentucky, I was seeing a snake every corner, you know, so I'm going to have something with me to protect me from snakes. Now, the reality of it was is I never saw that many snakes. But I have killed a couple of copperheads with this. I was glad to have it with me. Yeah, he, he actually pinned it with that, and we used my stick to smash his head. So it's, they're very handy. Walking sticks are very handy. You can reach over a log, make sure there's no snake. You can move some brush around, you know, make sure there's no snakes or whatever. If you're harvesting wild edibles, you can make sure the coast is clear. They're, they're very handy, so consider that. And we're we're not cruel I'd people. I just want to mention this. We're not cruel people. We love snakes, but the poisonous ones, I don't know that God ordained those. Right, yeah. If he's, if he's in my territory and he's poisonous, he will he, he'll be dispatched. Okay. That's, now, one thing I want to mention on these digging sticks so, so that everybody can hear before we get outside, because we're going to be using sharp instruments. And, you know, if you choose to do this activity, you might get cut. Don't hold me responsible, okay? We're going to give you some, some safety things, all right? Whenever you make your digging stick, you're going to do what's called chamfer the edges. If you just cut it off and you start pounding on the end of that stick, what's going to happen? It's going to split, splinter out. If you chamfer it, in other words, we'll show you what we mean by that. In other words, just sort of round it off. It will not split like that. Okay, so we'll show you actually how to do this when we get outside and we'll let you borrow some of our tools to do so. Now, one other thing that I wanted to mention on the hygiene, when I first moved to Kentucky and I mentioned we had no indoor plumbing and all, <clears throat> we tried several different ways to deal with our waste. It got old having to go outside at night, so we did we each had a bucket with a lid, and we would use that. And that's what people used to use. They call them a chamber pot. Okay? That's what we used at night. And then we, we tried to build an outhouse. Well, it didn't smell good. We tried the lime in it. Still didn't smell good. The, the thing that we found that was most useful was digging deep trenches. And I would, it was, that was my job because I was the youngest of the bunch at the time. And we would just dig these deep trenches. We had a tarp set up around it. And the trenches were just wide enough that you could put a foot on either side and you could, you could squat over that trench and then just put dirt over it. That worked better than just about anything, okay? Because you're burying it right away. But you don't want to have to dig a hole when you got to go. So we dug the trenches ahead of time. So we're being practical here. You know, we... we a lot, uh, Jim Buller mentions that when he took a group of people out one time for a week, some of the people were so inhibited to do their business in the woods that they held it until they got back. And then you're reabsorbing all that waste. You know, it's designed that we get rid of that stuff. So we need to deal with these very touchy but practical issues. Okay, what's next? We're trying to get one more uh, subject in of these priorities, and we want to take a look at fire. <coughs> now, what are some things we could use fire for? <coughs> Pardon? Heat to keep warm. Very good. What else? Cooking. Cooking. What else? Pardon? Medicine. medicine. Why would that be medicine? Hot and cold, very good. Very good. Very good. <clears throat> but also, too, they say if you stare at a fire, the flame increases the melatonin in your body as well. So it can be therapeutic, the fire. <clears throat> what else is fire good for? Protection. Protection, that's right. What else? To cook, I think somebody might have mentioned that. Cook, security, what, drying clothes. You're going to wash clothes, you need to dry them. So you can see that there is a great need for fire. Um, and so learning the skill of starting a fire, I don't know how many people have done that. Okay. What method did you use? 
Gasoline. <laughs> One of the methods we used was the solar, just from the sun. Okay, sun, let's take a look at that. Magnifying glass. When I was a young boy, I liked sports, and I had a ball glove, and when we bought ball gloves, we didn't have a bunch of selections to choose then. All of us boys, there were three in my family, we all got the same glove. So we needed to determine whose glove was which, and so our neighbor showed us how you could take the sun and you get the beam focused right, and you can burn your name into your glove in the leather. And so I thought, well, can you start a fire with that? Of course, <clears throat> of course you can. I did it when I was a kid. Yeah, so you can. Burn you just. With it. But this is limited. It has its limits because you have to have the sun to do so. Okay. Now it's much easier to start a fire with this if you have charred cloth. Because once you get the charged cloth um, lit up, which, let me grab some of the supplies here. here. Oh, you've got them all here. Oh, okay. Very good. I think the punk wood is over here. Does anybody know what charred cloth is? Yes. Okay. So those of you who have tried starting fires are familiar with what charred cloth is. Well, what we use is old the old denim jeans when they get... To where you can't wear them anymore, save them. And you cut them up into little sections. And you'll get a tin. I think this is an Altoid tin, but you can use any, any sort of tin. And how to make it is you fill the denim cloth in here that you've cut into sections, and you will close this. And these tins are not sealed well enough, but if you get one that seals real well, you'll have to put a hole in the top of it. And you set this in the fire and you let it burn and when you see it smoking you know it's doing its work once it's done smoking leave it in there for a few more well maybe another minute would be s sufficient but take it out don't open this because if you open it it's going to flame up and you're going to lose your charred cloth keep it closed let it cool off once it's cooled off you have charred cloth now you can do that too with this you probably can't tell what this is but this is what we call punk wood this is rotten wood, but it's very soft. You can do the same thing with this. We you, you have to make sure that you can just put your thumbnail right into it. Okay, we'll, we'll pass it around so you can see just at what stage it needs to be. And you make that the same way. Put it in a tin, of course, you can use a bigger one, and this one might be sealed better. I don't remember if we put a hole in the top of it or not. But one, again, when it's done smoking, take it off, let it cool. But the purpose of this is this will take a spark very easily, okay? And it gives you a larger, a larger mass of spark, you know, because it's, it's, you're gonna have not just one little piece of char cloth, you're gonna have this whole thing, just embers everywhere. And it, it's a lot easier to start a fire with good embers. So we're just going to cover the basics here probably not too much in depth because this is one we're going to do tomorrow all of you are going to get to be able to start a fire and so we'll go into more detail we're going to have hands on with this and this people think you have to be clever to be outdoor survival but if you got lighters use them do you They're, know how that works yeah. it's got a little flint and steel in it but the fuel is gas you know but don't throw it away when you're out of fuel because it's still got the flint and steel in it and so the charred cloth and the charred punk wood will take a spark you build a bird's nest now we're going to show you what you can make a bird's nest out of you can go and tear the bark off of a cedar tree and they've got that fibrous material that's behind it you build a bird's nest out of that and or you can use what we did, we, we collected some uh, light or not. Does anybody know what light or not is? Or not wood? Yeah. Alabama fight wood. Y'all don't know what this is? Canlin. Canlin. Yeah. yeah. But okay, good. Yeah, this stuff is gold. What this stuff is, is what we've done. We've scraped shavings of it because this is from a dead pine tree. And when the pine tree dies, all of the sap or the resin settles down into the trunk. 
So look for a pine tree that has died and has fallen over and start digging into the trunk. And you'll know when you find it because it's going to smell like pine, very strong of that resin. So once you put a spark to this, this will hold a flame for a while. It will be quite easy once you master this to start a fire with this. Um, but we're, again, we're going to show you how to build bird's nests. I brought some hay from the horses because it was dry this time of year. There's just not a lot of uh, material to make uh, bird's nests with. But again, tomorrow, we're going to go through all of this hands-on. But does anybody know what this is? You probably can't see that. This is a piece of steel, and this is a piece of flint. Now, when you go to Kentucky, you find flint everywhere. everywhere. It's very hard to find here, but you don't have to use flint. There are other stones that you can use. And I, I've got to hold this microphone, but Dana, if you want to demonstrate. It, mostly what you're going to find around here is chert. The object is you want to, and I know it's hard to see from here, but you want to hit the stone with as much force but as little co contact as possible. So you want a glancing blow, and that will give you some sparks. And what you do is you take a piece of the, the char cloth. We have a whole class section on this tomorrow, but we're just kind of giving you an idea. You just take a little piece of the char cloth, place it on the stone, and then you're going to strike it. It's a good idea to wear gloves when you do this because I have bloodied my knuckles many times uh, starting fire this way. But this is, this is a very reliable way, but it's not my absolute favorite way to start fire. And we're going to show you how to start a fire from the ground up, starting with these simple things to the smaller twigs, the bigger branches, how to set your fire that you can take advantage of the draft if there's a breeze outside. We'll go through all of those things. I would like my wife to show you this. She may have one there. My striker's not in here. This is what's called a ferro rod. <clears throat> Does anybody know what a ferro rod is? It's fire steel. Some people call it a fire steel. And we didn't, we didn't actually talk about knives and stuff yet. Well, tomorrow, again, we're going to have a separate class on the knives. We're going to go through the maintenance um, of a knife, the safety aspects of knives and axes, and how to keep them sharp and operable, and how to treat them. So we'll have more information dealing with the knives tomorrow. This particular knife comes with a ferro rod that has a very unique feature. This gray part here is magnesium. And if you don't know, I think magnesium burns at like 3,000 degrees. So you can take your knife, shave off a few of these magnesium pieces, and then throw a spark on it with the ferro rod, and it will burn. But I, I just wanted to mention that, that, that there is a difference between a magnesium rod and a ferro rod. The magnesium is just a fuel source, but the ferro rod is actually where you're going to get your sparks from. You can use the back of a knife. This one's new, so it doesn't have, let me see yours. Okay. You can actually really get some sparks off of the thing. Now, when I, when I had just had my hand surgery, this was very hard for me. But it's a lot easier now that I'm healed. But you can see you can really get some sparks with that. And I won't get carried away. This is my favorite part of the class. <laughs> play with fire. <laughs> yes, I like to play with fire. But we're all going to get an opportunity to play with fire tomorrow. So we just want to introduce it to you, the different ways that you can start a fire. Um, and it takes, it takes a skill. You think, well, that's pretty easy to get a spark in the charred cloth. Wait it's not difficult. It. But it does take practice. These are things that you need to practice to build a proper bird's nest, to build a proper fire. There are different ways and different fires. You can even have a fire that's smokeless. You know, and you may, there may be times where you want it to be smokeless. So tomorrow, if you come tomorrow, tomorrow morning, we're going to go through um, more detail and you'll get to do hands-on yourself. 
Um, as far as the fire, I think that's all we'll cover now. Um, but we've got different methods we're going to show you too. I uh, was told that you can soak cotton balls in petroleum jelly, so I tried that. And uh, it does work, but I just want to share you a mistake I made. I, I love my grandparents, the most favorite people in, in the world to me. They're all gone now, but I wanted a keepsake of my grandmother, and she gave me this coin purse. It's a leather coin purse. And so I just want to tell you, when you make cotton balls out of petroleum jelly, don't store them in the leather, leather purse. What's going to happen? That's right. The leather is going to absorb the petroleum out of the cotton balls. Now, I still tried the cotton balls. They still work, but they don't burn quite as long. But anyway, many different ways we can start a fire. It just <coughs> takes knowledge and practice. What's next on the list? Um, next is food. Do we want to... Okay, the only thing I, I would like to, because we're in here, I would like to talk about these different little stoves that we have up here. I know you may not be able to see from in the back the different little stoves, but I'm just going to take a minute and cover them. I think they can see them on the camera, and you're welcome to come up afterward. I kind of have these set up in an order of favorite, and what I believe is um, practical useful, effective, and all these things. So these are just some examples of cook pots that you might use on an actual campfire. I like this particular one because it comes with a little case and if you've never put a pot on an open fire it gets smut and soot all over your stuff. So it's good to have some type of container to put your pot in before you put it back in your backpack. Otherwise, everything's going to be covered. I like this because it has a bail, and it has a handle, and it has a little lid that you can, you can lift. Now, this is the basics right here, OK? So that's, this is my husband's. It goes in his backpack for cooking. When we can't buy or sell, one of the things that's going to really, of necessity, change is the way we cook because we're not going to have refrigeration. So are we going to be cooking a huge pot of spaghetti or a huge pot of soup that's going to last me for a few days? No. We're going to be cooking one meal at a time because we have no way to preserve it. Now, for me, sorry y'all, but I really don't care for being in the kitchen. I'd rather be outside. That's a little bit of a challenge, but at least I get to cook out of doors sometimes so that's that's a very positive thing for me now have you ever used a little can of sterno that's where you just take the lid off and you light a match and it it burns I think this is alcohol based um, these are designed to be used with the little collapsible stoves like this and it's fairly effective you can put or you could put a fire under here and, and burn you know this little stove with this. Now obviously we've never used this one. We just found this one at an Amazon return store and it was not damaged so we bought it um, just to kind of help show people this option. <clears throat> now this little cookware kit here, I first saw this at a Walmart a couple years ago. I think the name brand is Melissa and Doug's if I'm not mistaken. It says on the bottom of these pots, not intended for cooking. It's stainless steel and it's a fairly heavy weight stainless steel. So if you keep an eye on this, $25 for this little kit, okay, that has this little pot, which is fairly similar to my husband's cook pot for which I paid $35. Okay, so you do the math, $25. For this whole set, it even comes with some little wooden utensils. And for our tent situation, it's a nice little kit that can just sit either on the stove shelf or on a table or even hang on the wall of the tent. And so it's very organized. You're going to be cooking in small amounts, so this is a very good option. The other option, I want to show you this rocket stove when you come back from lunch. So when you come back, you have an assignment. I want you to bring some twigs. 
pencil sized twigs they can be anywhere from a foot long eight inches somewhere in there bring us some twigs because I want to demonstrate this stove okay you can just twigs you can just break okay the first time we got this rocket stove I think we that was the first time we used it was when we made that video so we do have videos on this on our YouTube channel the YouTube channel is under my name Dana Gazelshan if you've not seen our, our videos this thing really works it really puts out the heat it'll cook up your food right now but you've got to sit there and feed the little sticks into it okay so it's not something that you walk away from and you come back and your food is cooked that's not happening you've got to feed it and then we graduate up to what we call our little winter well cook stove okay the winter well we do have a video of on our YouTube channel this is a very nice little cook stove the only thing that I don't like about it is that on the door there's no gasket so you don't have as good a control here um, over the fire other than that this is a fabulous little stove we um, we did we haven't had a chance to use it in the tent yet we were going to and we both ended up with the flu a couple weeks ago so at any rate this comes with a water tank and you cannot put it on the stove without the water tank you'll burn up the little uh, gaskets gaskets in the, in the spigot and it spigot works very nicely I think this is a two liter is this two liter or one liter it's no. not very large but it's enough to just have a little bit of hot water on hand you can also hang this on the side of the stove okay if you're wanting to use the top for something else and I'll just show you how it it just <clears throat> has two little tabs here that just hang right on the side of the stove okay it also comes with an oven that you can bake in and it looks like a little easy bake kids oven that's a toy but I'm gonna tell you we kinda were looking at it like that and when we tested out this stove my husband put a toast a piece of toast here and a piece of toast here and this one was a crispy critter in short order so it really works well okay it's a very effective little little cook stove so you could actually bake bread or whatever in here and it collapses down this entire stove will fit in here and it is a little bit heavy for me my husband can move it with no problem for me I'm kind of like this you know but it's a cook stove it's a heat stove this right here could be a real game changer if you have to take a tent and go to somebody's property this right here would be a very good consideration for you um, I think that's pretty much it somebody gave me this um, cast iron pot here and you actually could bake with this on the top of this little stove by using this lid so you could actually bake some bread in that what we found was that the front of the stove tends to be the hottest and the middle would kind of be like medium and then back towards the, the chimney pipe it's not quite as hot okay this is a smaller stove than what we're going to show you the the one that we have in the tent but this stove is a little more expensive but I want to tell you this is a quality stove um, and when you understand what type of shelter you're going to be living in that's what you want to ascertain first as to what size of stove that you're going to need and want and do your research um, this one how much did this one run again with this with all the accessories we got all the accessories it was around 700 I yeah think. it was it was quite spendy but I want to tell you that is a quality stove that's going to last you a long time yeah and does anybody know what this is it's a little bitty fan yes it works on thermal electricity thermal electricity there's a little um, I don't know if you can see right here these two spots there's a little um, I forget what they call it it's a thermal pad of some sort and it converts heat energy into kinetic energy there's a little motor in here when this when you set it on the top of your wood stove and it gets hot this will begin to spin 
And the hotter it is, the faster it spins. Now, when we lived uh, on our farm in Kentucky, we had one of these to blow warm air back into our bedroom. And you could really tell a difference when it started working. It really moves the air. Very, very effective. OK, I think that's it. Uh, and we can stop for lunch now and come back. Um, I just wanted to mention one thing with the stove, because we learned this too, that if you're going to build your own structure, because now if you have a structure already, um, this would probably limit it to that, but size your stove to the structure that you have, number one. <clears throat> number two, don't make the mistake that almost everybody makes, and they put their stove in the corner of their house. You're putting all your heat in the corner, and then you got to get it out of there. Put your stove in the middle of the house, and when we built our house, we made sure that the kitchen was in the center of our home. And so that's where we put our stove. That way the heat was evenly distributed throughout the house, and we designed it in such a way that there wouldn't be a lot of curves and hallways because you got to get that heat down there. And I cut uh, vents um, above the doors and in different areas to the rooms that were next to it to allow the heat because heat rises. It, it's, a, it's a good way to transfer the heat um, to different rooms because this is going to be your heat source, going to be your cook source. Your stove is going to be a very valuable tool, so do some research. Know what size of stove you want, do the customer reviews, and spend some time. And if it costs you a little more like this one did, it was okay because this stove is well worth it. By the way, I didn't eat these. I just rescued the can at Christmas from my family. So <laughs> this is uh, pine shavings, the, the fatwood kindling. And we'll talk about this more tomorrow. So most of the time when we talk about this stuff, one of the first things that I say when we start talking about no buy, no sell is that I believe that time has already begun. I neglected to say that this morning. We were talking to Brother John, and he made that statement. He reminded us, and it is true. If you think about how easy is it to buy good food these days, it's not very easy. If it's not genetically engineered, it's loaded with pesticides, or, 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 or it's not grown on soils that are full of nutrients. And so if the soil doesn't have the nutrients to give the plant, then the plant is not going to have the nutrients that our body needs. And that, I believe, is why we're seeing so many health issues today. It's because our bodies are completely depleted of minerals. That's why we like to promote the use of fulvic and humic minerals, but that's a discussion for a different time. So this problem with buying and selling has already begun, and now, um, since the war began between Russia and Ukraine, fuel prices are going up, food prices are starting to go up. And so we're just going to see this problem escalate. And if we're not in a position to grow our own food and supplement that with what we can harvest from nature, we're really going to be in a predicament. That's why I like to preach the foraging message, because Foods that you pick out in nature are grown in native soil. It's where they want to be. So they're going to have a lot more nutrition in it than foods that we can grow on soils that have been used and used and used and perhaps not properly amended. I'm sure that this soil is properly amended. OK, how many of you have a supply of seeds? Very good, but I would like to see every hand go up. If you don't have good garden seeds, and what do I mean by good garden seeds? I don't just mean organic. I mean open pollinated heirloom seeds that will come back true to that seed stock. In other words, many of these seeds that have been hybridized, when you plant that seed, it's going to come true to whatever the box or bag says. <clears throat> but if you save the seeds from that produce and try to grow those seeds the next year, they're going to begin to revert back to what they were bred from. So they're not going to come true to the parent that it came from. 
If you save your seeds off of open pollinated heirloom plants, learn to save your own seeds, then you know you always have good quality fresh seeds. So this is not something that's going to just happen overnight. That's why we, we really feel kind of urgent to share these things with people because even though, as we mentioned this morning in the PowerPoint, the real focus of Closure for Jesus ministry is not survival or country living or even medical missionary work. The real focus is helping us to be prepared in heart and life to cooperate with Christ in his work right now to put an end to sin. And that's what we're waiting for. He's, he wants to come back. Okay, <clears throat> a couple other things. We're just touching on some things that we forgot to mention this morning. Um, any of you in the wintertime, do your thumbs ever split right here at the corner of your nail? How does that feel? That can be very painful, can't it? Well, when we can't buy and sell and you can't get your regular whatever it is you put on that, how are you going to take care of that? What are you going to do if you get... When we last, um, I think it was last June, we flew out to Oregon and we did a seminar out there. And it's much drier there than where we at the time lived in Kentucky. And, of course, we were speaking all week, and I had more classes to do because people were very interested in herbs and stuff like that. So I was talking a lot, and I got dehydrated. And my lips got so chapped, they looked like a piece of raw beef. And they were so painful. Finally, I had time to run to a store and find some Burt's Bees or something. But what if I couldn't buy or sell? How would I deal with that? Two things that I can tell you right now off the bat are difficult to find in nature are oils and salt. There are salt stores, different places. Now we can get here in this area, I might go for finding a hickory tree. Has anybody ever eaten hickory nuts? Nobody's ever eaten a hickory nut? They're delicious. Y'all got to try that this fall. But bring your hammer because they're very hard to open. Yep, yep, very hard. When I was a kid, we raised hogs, and we could throw those things in the hog pens, and they ate them like candy, just crunch, crunch, like it was nothing to it. Yes. Yeah, I didn't want to get stuck in the hog pen. My sister took care of the hogs, and I did the horses and the cows. So anyway, just think about that kind of thing comfort-wise. If you can't buy chapstick, if you can't buy hand lotion or some kind of salve, if your thumbs split, you can't buy band-aids to put on. These are the kind of things that we really need to be brainstorming together about. It would be ideal to have groups of you get together and say, what about this? What about that? What might you do? What, what could we, how could we solve this problem? You guys have a tremendous resource here. All these young people, man, you guys could solve some problems. <clears throat> okay, one other thing that I wanted to mention my husband was talking about this morning how during the no-buy, no-sale time frame, there's still people in the cities to warn, but we're not going to be buying fuel, so we won't be driving our vehicles. So how are we going to get to the city to warn the people who need to hear the truth? We're going to be walking, right? Well, I don't know about you, but I don't, I'm just not too sure I can walk all the way to Columbus in a day comfortably. Number one, I'm not in that kind of shape, you know, and so <clears throat> I need to be. But even during that time, we're going to need to have some wilderness survival type skills because we're probably going to be camping along the way. He mentioned navigating. You know, we may actually have to travel in the woods. Do we know how to navigate our way around? Do we have maps? I'm not the one to teach you how to navigate. I've not studied it enough. But if there's anybody here who's ex-military, you know how to do that, right? Okay, so you have resources here who could teach you. But what I wanted to mention is about the backpacks. I'm going to just step here just quick. <coughs> this is my husband's military backpack. Now, I do have one of these in my van. 
because if you think back when uh, they had the big snowstorm up in Atlanta a couple of years ago, all of those interstates were parking lots. Nobody went anywhere. And if you didn't have some kind of supplies in your vehicle, you were in a world of hurt. So we keep a backpack in our vehicle at all times that has a little bit of food, fire starting, flashlight, maybe an extra pair of warm socks, a few things like that. This stays in my husband's truck and I have one like it in my van, but it's smaller because these military backpacks, I cannot take the straps up enough to fit me. Okay, I'm just a little bitty person. And so I'm not going to adjust his straps, but you can see that's not very comfortable for backpacking, okay? Now for him, it fits much better. What I decided to go with um, instead was to be fitted, and this is not packed for backpacking. It's way too heavy right now. This probably weighs about, I'm guessing, 25 or 30 pounds. Way too much weight, okay? But I'm right now just storing things in it. But if you'll notice, one thing that I'd like to point out about this pack is that the back is, what do they call it, ergonomic? Ergonomics. So it's, it's designed to fit my back. I was measured for this backpack. The waist, you can see how little that is. That's designed for my body. The shoulder straps are very small because my back is very small. And so you might want to consider, rather than a military backpack, which those are great, they've got all the straps and everything, this is much more comfortable for me, okay? I can put the strap around my waist, and that's where my load is, is on my hips here, okay? So this is much more comfortable to me, and I'm carrying the weight here on my hips. Sorry about that. At any rate, you might want to consider being measured for a backpack, particularly if you're a smaller person or if you have a very short waist or something like that, okay? so. Some of you may not have this issue, but those of us who are half pints, it's an issue to be contended with. Nothing fits when you're petite, right? Okay, let's see what else I have forgotten. I think it's your turn. Okay, as my wife said, what we want to do before we go outside, there were just a few items that we had overlooked that were on the table here, we want to mention them to you. Um, and as all of you know, it seems like the whole world is into this prepping. You know, so it's not hard to find ideas to um, sustain yourself. And what do I mean? For example, lights. There's all kinds of lighting out there that you can find that's powered solar. Just set it in the sun, even flashlights. Um, I've even got a couple that they got little generators inside of them. It's got a handle on here. I don't like this. I can't demonstrate anything. But you take it out and you crank it. Um, we've got others that fold out. Again, little solar panels. They're sustainable. Um, you don't need batteries. But if you do have electricity or a solar system, um, I would highly recommend, I use nothing anymore but rechargeable batteries. I see the church does here too. Um, yeah, it's been setting for a while. But anyway, rechargeable batteries, um, a great idea. Um, I think that was it. Oh, yeah. These, these are the lights that we used when we built our home before we had electricity. And these little lights, I tell you, are fabulous. Don't look like much. But you can hang them wherever you want them. And what I like about it is it's remote control as well. So you're not fiddling with switches, but just set these out by a window, run the cord in the house if you want, and you charge them. They'll hold a charge often as we use them. Um, 
those are probably the best lights that that we have used. Um, lights. What else did we forget? Oh, compass. It was mentioned. Now we're not going to deal with this, but it is a good idea if you know you're going to be in a certain area to get a map of that area, and then get yourself a compass and orient yourself to the surroundings that you're living in. A compass can be a real lifesaver. If you're out in the woods, you get lost, um, know the area that you're at, identify it, and you can find yourself uh, back home using the compass in your map. Um, also, let's see, what else did we forget here? Oh, something I highly recommend to all of you. <laughs> a little miniature Bible. Um, it's easy to overlook. Um, something so special, but you know the times that we're coming in, it's good to have this encouragement. Um, it's even better if we can put it in our hearts. But I wanted to mention that we keep these, um, I, churches give them away, you can buy them as well. Um, another thing too, um, books. While you can still get books to learn how to identify wild edibles, medicinal uh, plants, those kind of things, um, knots, we've got all kinds of books. Knots, you would think, well, what do I need to know about knot tying? Um, but we'll get into knots tomorrow, but I'll give an example. Before I knew how to tie knots, there was a vehicle that went in the ditch, and so I just tied my double overhand knot that I usually tie, and I pulled them out. I got them out, the knot held, but I could not untie that rope. And we're going to learn knots that you can tie and pull vehicles out and still be able to un untie them. But we're going to not spend much time on pulling vehicles out, but more practical things as far as setting up a tent. There's certain knots you want to use to be able to keep them tight. Tot lines, truckers hitches, different things. Knots, until you have a purpose for them, you'll never understand the real value of them. But we're going to look at that tomorrow. Um, so get books, gardening books. If you don't have gardening skills, get books on gardening. Just think of the things, the practical skills that you'll need to know. Get books for them because the internet, we're going to lose the internet. So books are valuable. Hang on to your books. Um, if you don't mind, talk about these. Some of you were not here this morning and we mentioned this book on basic wilderness survival that we have. We have a few copies left. These are $12. And then we also have some paracord, if you want to be ready for the knot tying class tomorrow. The paracord is five. The books are $12. So if, if you want one of these, the information is really good. You're welcome to come up and look it over if you'd like to. OK. How many people took notes this morning? Good. Turn your notes upside down. Don't look at them. We want to review, because we have some new people here, I see. So let's do a little reviewing. OK, I, I have a mic, so I don't, I don't need two. <laughs> you remember the survival priorities that we talked about this morning? OK, what's number one? I'm gonna, well, I want them in order. What's number one? Shelter, Shelter. OK. What's number two? Water. Water. Okay, good. They were listening. What's number three? Okay, who says health concerns? Now, what was the other thing that was mentioned? Fire. Who says fire? Okay, health concerns. What's number four? Fire. Fire, good, okay. And finally, what's number five? Food. Now, which one would most people put number one? Food. <laughs> exactly. But it's actually the last of our priorities. We can live for a couple weeks without food, really. We might not feel good, we might be kind of grumpy, but we could live, okay. Another review, too. Um, because we want to keep these things in mind and we need to start investing into them. What were the tools that we talked about this morning? Can you name some? Pardon? 
A sword? A sword. The closest thing we have to a sword He must have been sleepy while we were talking this. about this. <laughs> we have one it's close. He saw that earlier. That, that's where he that's got That's the closest that. we get to a sword. Yeah. A digging stick. Very good. What's, Very the, good. what's the use for digging stick? Digging sticks. That's right, to dig a hole for your waste. That's right. It can be used for other things, foraging as well. Yes. Okay, other tools. Walking stick. What's the good use for a walking stick? Pardon? <laughs> it worked for me. <laughs> yes. Walking sticks are so nice. It, you can take a load off of your feet when you're walking and when you're foraging. It's always nice to poke around first before you put your hand down. I heard this. Axe. I heard somebody say axe. We're going to talk more about these cutting and chopping and digging tools and all this stuff. Yeah, we'll go into more detail of those tomorrow. What other tools? Fire starter, that's right. Okay. What do you use fire for? What can we use it for? Warming our food, cooking in, heat, purifying water. Protection. Protection. Sleep. Pardon? Making charcoal, very good. We didn't talk about that. Yes, you can make charcoal with it. All right, what other tools? What other tool? Pardon? Pocket knife. What? Pardon? First aid. First aid kit. What do you say about knives? One is none and... One is none and two is one. Two is one. So get a good pocket knife. Now, uh, me... Fixed blade. We're going to talk more about the difference between fixed blade, folding knives, full tang, partial tang, all that. We're going to go into that tomorrow and the different uses for the different knives. Now, for me, you see some bigger knives up here, but they, they serve a different purpose. And so for me, I just want you to know that a knife to me is not a weapon. A wife to me, or a knife to me is a tool, a wife too. <laughs> a good tool. <laughs> but that's a case where one is enough. <laughs> Two is not good. All right, I'll just name them off. Cordage, and we're going to get into more of this too when we do some knot tying tomorrow, but cordage, um, very practical, very useful. Containers, you know, we need to collect water, we need to cook food, we're going to need containers. Um, so start thinking of these things. Stoves, do you have a wood-burning stove? How are you going to heat? How are you going to cook? There's a lot of things you can do with a wood stove. And remember too, with the cooking, these honking big ginormous pots that we're used to using now to make a big old pot of soup that's going to last for three or four days, we don't have refrigeration. So it's not going to do us any good to make that big old honking pot of soup because it's going to go bad. So we're going to be cooking in smaller pots, okay? Also gloves. Now, don't overlook gloves, as I mentioned. Gloves are really a good tool. They can save a lot of nicks and cuts, and because I do carpentry work, plumbing, and different things, I wear gloves all of the time. I used to not to, but I got cut so many times and nicks and scrapes and band-aids, I just started wearing gloves. I didn't have those little cuts and nicks anymore. And when we're out there in the time when we can't uh, go and have medical facility services, we don't want to be getting infections. We want to be protecting our body. So, well, What are two other clothing items? <clears throat> For those of you who were not here this morning, those of you who were here, help them out. What are two other clothing items that are critically important? Footwear and, and a stocking cap. Yes, you've got to keep your head warm and you've got to keep your feet warm and protected. Okay. Bedding is another one. We want to have bedding, good bedding. And knowledge, have knowledge, study, prepare. And, you know, we can have first aid kits, but if we don't know how to use them, we need to know how to use these things. So make your own list. You know your needs. We've just given you some. Start investing in those. And we always recommend invest in something that is quality. Do your research. Um, and if you don't know, like I said, there's so many preppers out there, you can always find good ideas of equipment, um, material. It's just a vast array that you can go on the internet for yourself. 
So what we want to do next now is, oh, I wanted to mention also too, I am so thankful for institutions like this. I really am. Because there is something that is so important and it is so needed. We know that diseases are going to spread in the end times. And the knowledge that people are learning here, it is so valuable. You can't even put a price upon it because there are going to be so many people who have a need and we will be able to meet their need. And remember, Jesus said, when you've done it unto the one of the least of these, my brethren, you've what? You've done it unto him. So I'm thankful for these institutions. What we want to do now is to go outside. Did anybody gather any sticks or twigs? Okay, well let's go outside right over here and let's see if we can put those sticks and twigs to use. <clears throat>